Roberts. I'm the director of the Welsh Value and Health Centre, and I'm really excited to moderate this session today where we'll be exploring how to embed PROMS in direct care from the clinical perspective. And we've got an ambitious panel um, to get through today um, because we really wanted to present content from three distinct clinical areas, uh, oncology, chronic disease management, and also uh, episodic care and how you know there are subtle differences in how we may use PROMS uh, across those broad uh, clinical areas. So we have Linda uh, Edmonds, who is a consultant nurse in heart failure and cardiac, cardiac rehabilitation from South East Wales. We have Shona Jones, who is the lead IBS dietitian in Swansea Bay University Health Board. Dr Katie Spencer, academic clinical oncologist from the University of Leeds. We have Dr Mohid Khan, who is a consultant gastroenterologist and uh, leads the Neuroendocrine Cancer Service in South Wales. We have Dr Peter Hall, academic medical oncologist from the Edinburgh Cancer Centre. Angie Kingman, clinical outcomes manager from Northumbria Healthcare and uh, Mr Phil Thomas, who is a consultant orthopaedic surgeon who's been working with PROMS for many years um, in Cardiff. Uh, so I would like to hand you over straight away to, to Linda Edmonds, who's going to kick us off with her work in heart failure. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Linda Edmonds. I'm a consultant nurse working with the Heart Failure and Cardiac Rehabilitation Services in an Iron Bevan um, Health Board. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we've been working with this group of patients now um, for around about four years, introducing PROMS into their care. Um, there's a strong body of evidence that we know that if managing heart failure patients, if you optimise their medical therapy promptly, um, provide education and self-management techniques, we can improve their outcomes and reduce their hospital admissions along with improving their quality of life. The um, situation that we had around about four years ago with us in an RM Bevan is that we had a one size fit it all. So patients were referred into the nursing service, um, put onto a waiting list, seen in clinic, um, as and when there was an appropriate appointment slot and all patients had the same length of um, appointment. And the frustrations that we were coming across is that we had long waiting lists, we weren't able to review patients promptly. Um, and obviously this isn't good care for patients nor and very frustrating for nursing teams. So we introduced PROMS and started to make changes to our, our clinical practice and services. Working with PROMS with heart failure patients so as a long-term condition brings its complexities. Um, we tend to, um, we see these patients over many months, often many years, even if it's on and off. And patients living with a long-term condition, they will often see their symptoms as being normal and therefore using a PROM with them, they find it very difficult to, to pick out small changes in their actual symptoms itself. And also with this patient group, quite often they don't see, we may not see improvement in symptoms and over a period of time we know they're going to get worse. Um, so we need to think from a service point of view, if we're using a PROM in this long term condition, how we actually manage that in practice and manage patient expectations. Unfortunately, long term conditions don't come in isolation. Um, so again, it's another difficulty for patients as to differentiating their symptoms between their different diseases. Um, and I think it's a question sometimes to ask ourselves, does this actually matter um, when we're asking around patient outcomes? Um, as a service, trying to respond in a timely manner, that itself is difficult as well, because if we're working with long term conditions and over a period of time for heart failure patients, if their symptoms deteriorate and they're using their PROMs and working with us, we need to think how we can actually respond to this in, in, a, in a, a meaningful way. What we found over the last um, few years is that using PROMs in isolation with a long term condition isn't necessarily um, an effective way um, and what we found was that because of the reasons I said around them identifying their symptoms and whether it's heart disease or renal disease or respiratory disease we found that we've developed a, a clinical outcome reported um, measures as well which we use in conjunction with the PROMS side by side and this over the last four years has really helped us to develop our confidence um, in terms of our clinical management with patients to be sure that what we're looking at are the heart failure symptoms and not um, another part of their long term conditions. So just at the bottom of the slide to show you quickly, as an example, we use these um, PROMs and CROMs within clinical practice. We use them initially as a baseline when the patient's first referred to us. 
Then after two weeks, which is the orange line that you will see looking at their um, symptoms and then again on discharge from our service or at six months, whichever is the earlier. And you will see as you go across that line for this patient, just as an example, there's an improvement in PROM scores and their total scores at the end. Right at the end of that um, diagram, you've got the NYHA classification for heart failure. And both on the first two appointments, they scored three, which is quite a high score for heart failure. But as they've been optimised on the medical therapy and their symptoms have improved, we've seen a drop. So it's just to give an example how we manage the PROM with the CROM both at the same time. So that's just an example how we use it in clinical practice. Um, we work with the patients when they don't often identify their symptoms. We're able to, to look back and show them how they've changed over a period of time. So it's used and embedded within our service with our clinical reviews. Next slide, please. We also then, the PROM is very much around our service development and delivery for the long-term conditions. So um, how we've moved forward, we're now more confident having a PROM and a CROM together that helps to inform our clinical decision-making. Um, and what we've been able to do is actually to change our clinics and to make more bespoke clinics appointments. So using the, both the PROM and the CROM together, we've actually changed our clinic. So we're now able to offer a bespoke sort of system. So some patients will have a 10 minute appointment, some patients would have a 30 minute, some patients, those with complex would have a 45 minute appointment. Um, so we are able to respond to the clinical patient needs itself. And the, the, the line across the right of the slide is showing the ISHOM data set and the time scales where we would try and keep to being on baseline 30 days and every six months then until discharge. Um, what we've learned from a service point of view ourselves working with this group of patients, we actually see that we don't wait for the month, we see them at two weeks and we've introduced a prom and crumb there. We've also leaving at six months is a long time for some of the long term conditions to try and unpick their symptoms. So we're now in the process where we're going to start to try and add it in halfway through their therapy. So we're sticking with a national time scale, but we're also seeing what's meaningful for our cohort of patients to, to make it more beneficial for them. And just as an example, an average month, we may have 24 patients complex clinics where they'd be given 45 minute appointments, but we'd also have 32 patients in our community hub where we're now offering patients every week, um, a weekly or two weekly appointments, so just a 10, 15 minute appointment. And that's only been possible because we are very confident now using the PROMs alongside the CROMs that we've been able to change the way that we work completely. And we're able to see patients and, and really move them through the service in around about four to six weeks. The final thing that we found with a lot The final thing that we found um, with the long term conditions is looking at unmet need. So next slide, please. Um, when we're looking at our data with these patients, as an example, one of the questionnaires we use in our data set is the PHQ2, looking at their psychological needs. And um, what is suggested that a score of three or above would mean that somebody would have some psychological needs and maybe some intervention is required. Um, so as a service, we, we would look at that, we, we work with patients, we would signpost to CBT or counselling services of rehabilitation. However, when we've gone and looked at aggregate data, we looked at more than a thousand patients were actually scoring a score of three and above. And then the outcomes were only five patients were offered counselling and only 88 were offered cardiac rehabilitation. So using the, the problems um, from a service need in terms of development for that patient, um, we've been able to sort of identify that there is a need to perhaps make some psychological intervention early on in that heart failure patient's journey. Um, so it's made us question our practice, responding to patient needs and patient demands. Um, yes, these scores are taken early on, but it raises the question, should we in fact be introducing a psychological support very early on in the patient's pathway rather than leaving it you know, for several weeks or months um, and to question our practice as a team? So. It, I think what we're trying to show is that we use the PROMs very much for the long term conditions in clinical practice. It helps the patients, but we've also very much over a long period of time, we've been able to use the outcome data to help us change our model and also continually looking to see where the needs of the patients are and what they're reporting as their PROMs, how we can continue to develop the service. So thank you very much. If I could just hand over to Seanad, who I believe is the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have the next slide, please? Hi, I'm Sean Ed, IVS lead dietitian here at Swansea Bay University Health Board, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today about um, how we've used PROMs and PREMS within our IBS service. Um, can I have the next slide, please? 
Thank you. So just to give you a bit of background about our service and, and what we do. We provide specialist advice to people with IBS, including the highly successful low FODMAP diet, which is known to um, be successful for about 75% of people. We, we've been up and running as a service since September 2020. We started fairly small as a bit of a, a pilot project um, and initially just accepted referrals from one primary care cluster and from gastroenterology and um, transfers of care within dietetics. Um, and our aim really was to get local data because we knew um, we had loads of data from across the country of how effective these services could be, um, but we need to prove, prove our worth locally to get that permanent funding and um, be able to continue to provide this service to our patients. So we, with the support of um, the value-based healthcare team, we've, we got set up on a um, off-the-shelf platform um, with some behind the, behind the scenes coding from the value based healthcare team, um, which sends for digital forms out via text or email um, to our patients at, at allocated um, points within their care pathway. So the, the diagram you can see on the screen, um, if you look at yellow circle number one, you'll see that is our triage questionnaire. And that gets sent out as soon as a referral is added to the system. We use that to um, screen for any red flags, um, gather information about what, what changes the patient has already tried. Um, and it's, it's just there to support me to decide whether to put a patient into a one-to-one -one slot or a, a group slot. Um, and that saves us a whole clinic appointment per patient, really. Um, yellow circles two and three, they represent our PROMS forms. Um, we use, we've got a pre-intervention form and a post-intervention form. Um, but they are very similar because they're both both based on the King's College London um, gastrointestinal symptom evaluation um, form um, with a few added questions on each. Um, and that just makes it really easy for us to compare pre-interventions, post-intervention and see what's happening. The pre-intervention form is sent out automatically a week before the initial appointment and then the post-intervention a week before any further appointments after that. Um, and usually we only need two appointments per patient, so that's usually enough. We then have our PREMS form represented by yellow circle number four. And that is sent out three months after discharge. We've got some of the sort of um, the usual questions such as um, how can we improve the service and so on. But we also have um, some more tailored questions to look at how patients are coping with their, their diet longer term after they've been discharged from the service as well. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So what have we learned from the process? Patient engagement, as we all know, is really key to, to gathering these, these patient reported sorts of data. Um, and to be honest, being digital is, I think, what's made the biggest difference in terms of getting that patient engagement. Um, we've got really good numbers in terms of um, the response rates to the forms. And I think another factor in that is um, careful planning when it comes to when we send the forms out and what communication goes alongside them. So for example, with our triage form, so if you remember, that's the first form that we send out. Um, at the same time, they are sent a letter, like a holding letter, which, um, asks them to either either complete the form. It tells them to expect a text or an email and, and to either complete the form or get in touch with us within two weeks. And 
it says that if we haven't heard from them, we will assume they don't want an appointment. And that sort of sets that expectation up nice and early. And once the patients have have done that first form, they've seen how easy the process is and they tend to keep doing it then um, when we send further forms out. The other thing I do is I make sure that I um, I'm continually referring back to their their symptom form during their appointment so that they can really see how useful that form is to their care as an individual as well. Um, the majority of patients are more than happy to complete forms online. Um, we've only had a handful in the last well over a year and a half now, isn't it? Um, that have have phoned and asked to, to do it over the phone instead. Um, so that has saved us loads of time. Um, the only real technical glitch we've had is that um, obviously if there isn't a, an appropriate mobile number or email address saved um, onto the system before the referral is added, then, then the forms can't be sent out. So it, we've just had to get in the habit of, of checking those phone numbers before we send them out and making sure that nobody's added any letters after the phone number, which sometimes happens. We get personalised reports, um, which are essentially taken from the um, the platform that we use and the value based healthcare team sort those and send them on to us every month, um, which are absolutely brilliant and we can use them then in business cases and when we're presenting to stakeholders and so on. And the other slightly unexpected benefit we've had is that um, as we use a quite a widely used platform um, when I've when I published an article recently um, a lot of other dietitians who are using that platform and working in a similar setting actually got in touch and we we're in the very, very early stages, but we might be working on some national research soon um, to make it easier for other dietitians to set up these sorts of services, um, which has been made so much easier by that technology again. Um, so some very exciting opportunities have come out of it as well. Thank you very much for listening um, and I look forward to answering your questions later. I'll hand you over now to Dr Katie Spencer. Thank you. Thanks, Shonad. Um, next slide, please. So I'm Katie Spencer. I'm a consultant clinical oncologist in Leeds, um, and I think I'm actually going to pick up uh, pick up where Shonad's just left off. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Kermit. Uh, Kermit is not, in fact, the little green chap in the corner, but is a project that we've been involved in um, trying to identify some key performance indicators for the use of electronic patient reported outcome measures in oncology. This has been adopted by the NCRI Living With and Beyond Cancer Group, and I'm sure that most of you are very well aware of this sort of extensive evidence base, and we've got a big evidence base in cancer for the use of EPROMs that it improves quality of life, health services outcomes and also in, in fact in some settings overall survival for our patients. So lots of really good data to support using EPROMs and lots of real enthusiasm in the community about getting involved in the use of EPROMs but also lots of challenges um, and I'm sure as, as we've heard lots of different people implementing this and actually lots of different settings, even in cancer that we might want to use them in. Lots of different providers all offering different platforms and lots of different questionnaires that we can be using. So it can be a little bit sort of difficult and daunting for clinicians. And certainly in our experience, when you come into this thinking, well, I, I know I want to do EPROMs, but how am I going to go about it? What does good look like? And so what we wanted to do was try and work out a framework of key performance indicators that might give us an indication of what good looks like for EPROMs in oncology. So the Kermit project came out of this and the first next slide, please. The first step of the project was really a scoping review. And so the scoping review aimed to identify from the literature themes and domains that we could cover, try and find some key performance indicators and also panel members who would be able to help us to whittle these down once we've identified some of our KPIs. So we carried out the systematic literature searches, with over two and a half thousand papers identified. And those are just for routine use of PROMs in cancer care. So this isn't any of the PROM um, validation of the tools. This isn't randomized trials or anything, it's purely implementation of EPROMs. And we've whittled that down to 42 studies and then identified KPIs and domains from there. And we focused them in to ensure that they're relevant, 
that they're deliverable and also try to avoid duplication between the different KPIs. Next slide, please. And so what we've ended up with is a matrix and the matrix incorporates all of the key stakeholders. So we've got patients, professionals and providers in there. And then we've got different aspects of the implementation of PROM. So are they, is the EEPROM system acceptable? Is it feasible? And what's the impact of it? And each of these boxes actually contains anywhere between one and 10 different sort of key performance indicators. And I've just selected a single one for each of them as a sort of example for you to, to get a feel for what's in here. But the things we're looking at are things like the percentage of missing items per questionnaire, giving an indication of how feasible it is for the patients to fill these in. The percentage of professionals who are satisfied with the role of EEPROMs and its contribution to care um, and the percentage of patients that are attending A&E over a month. So lots of sort of aspects there that we've picked up across that matrix. Next slide, please. And so the next step of the project is really to say, well, actually, we've we've populated that matrix. We've got a huge number of different KPIs, but probably some of them aren't as important as others. Maybe they're not as relevant and we need something that's going to be manageable and, and usable by clinicians. So we've brought together a panel that includes patient representatives, clinicians, academics and EEPROM providers. And we'd be very happy for anybody who has an interest in EEPROMs in cancer care to, to join that panel and contribute if you'd like to. Um, so round one is ongoing. Um, and in each case, we've taken each KPI, said, said to the panel, is it relevant? Does it, is this something that matters? Do you think it's important? How, is the way that we've said we might measure it also achievable? Can we do this? Is there any overlap? Does this duplicate one of the other key performance indicators that we've got? And have we missed something? Is there, is there anything else out there that we should be measuring and that we're not? And what we'll do is we'll whittle that down to a sort of shortlist and go through a second round of the Delphi consensus to try and reduce this so that we've got a framework of KPIs for UK adopters of EEPROMs in cancer care. And hopefully clinicians and providers are then going to be able to use that to help them to implement PROMs, to make improvements to their existing PROM systems, and really sort of allow us to embed EEPROMs more widely based upon how well they are performing um, and support uh, services in doing that. So next slide, please. If you'd like to contribute, then the, the website is there um, and we're very happy to, to hear from you. Thank you very much. And I'll just uh, I'll pass on to Mohid now. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Katie. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to talk about neuroendocrine cancer, neuroendocrine tumours, and it's going to be a, a very brief presentation. Um, so if you don't know about neuroendocrine tumours, um, they're complex cancers um, rising mainly from the gut, gastroenteropancreatic tract, and they can metastasize, and generally they're slow growing. Um, Next click, please. Uh, the incidence of NETs are rising, the orange line, over the last few decades compared to um, all cancers, which is the blue line. Next click, please. And um, in South Wales, prior to 2016 to 17, there was a, a fragmented service, and effectively there was a PREM undertaken, um, which was commissioned with an overall satisfaction rate of 19%, and lots of other things which suggested care was fragmented and patients had poor outcomes experience. And uh, I started to collect on paper PROMs. So this is a story of how we've utilised PROMs at an individual level and then at a service-based level in what, as Sally suggests, is um, a mixture of those three types. This is a cancer, a chronic disease with episodic care. Next slide, please. And so this is the model that I uh, talk about uh, with neuroendocrine cancer, and this can be years. Patients can survive for many, many years, even with metastatic disease. And their symptoms uh, may not relate to their tumour burden, uh, which is in blue. The symptoms can, uh, can vary over time, particularly gastrointestinal symptoms. So I brought in paper proms uh, as soon as I started. Uh, we utilised that in clinic. Uh, and may relate to quality of life. Uh, next click, please. Uh, next click, please. Just actually just click all the way through. So we just brought in PROMs at various points. Next slide, please. And uh, that was based on EOT quality of life questionnaires, validated tools, 
but also from my experience in the Marsden, uh, where we looked at the long term effects of uh, cancer therapies. And there's a whole presentation behind this, but lots of things were improved in terms of uh, commission white across South Wales, working across health boards, uh, focusing on the patients and actually utilising the first prompts to identify where service needs to be changed, including in, uh, psychology assessments and interventions and symptom based management. Um, and overall patient satisfaction with the PREM after service transformation actually improved. Next click please. And uh, median diagnosis time also halved in this very difficult to diagnose cancer, which was probably a um, uh, result of other um, pieces of work that we're doing, but the patient satisfaction probably related to um, utilizing uh, PROMs and instigating service transformation with various elements uh, right across the health boards. Uh, next slide, please. And so we measured uh, the collated all the PROMs, and this is paper based, but with the Valuing Health team and others uh, were able to analyze uh, the pre and post transformation numbers. And next click, please. And there's statistical significant difference uh, reduction in symptom scores uh, on the validated tool and quality of life um, with a high proportion of patients feeling their symptoms uh, were addressed. Um, so next slide, please. So overall, we've, we've learned a lot. Initially, it was by introducing PROMs at an individual basis to identify what patients required for their cancer and chronic symptoms from new endocrine tumours, um, which could be a number of things, uh, medication changes, looking at GI, gastrointestinal uh, di alternative diagnosis, such as bilateral malabsorption, um, at, or surgical intervention. So there may be in, uh, interventions required which may be uh, anti-cancer therapy, which we instigate, or our oncologists, or debulking with our, our surgeons. So um, we utilise that on an individual basis and also helped uh, design our service together with patients at the table. And this is, uh, we've now moved on to electronic PROMs, um, uh, utilising my clinical outcomes, um, where we have started to embed it within our systems um, starting at small scale, but spreading across the uh, region to help patients um, in all health boards uh, referred into our tertiary service. Um, so um, that's it for me. Hopefully that's a, a brief presentation and I now move on to Peter. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Peter Hall, consultant medical oncologist at the Edinburgh Cancer Centre. Uh, next slide, please. I'd just like to give you an overview of uh, what we're doing in the way of problems in cancer care in Scotland. So the landscape of cancer problems in Scotland over the last few years, I guess we first saw problems feature in the cancer strategy um, about six years ago in 2016, when there was reference to the uh, problems as part of a wider collection of outcomes to help us understand if we're realising the, the goals of improving outcomes and reducing inequalities in cancer care. Um, and things have evolved to the most recent um, cancer strategy in Scotland last year to um, a commitment to understand the potential of problems in cancer care. We're due for a further update um, to strategy later this year and we're hoping that we'll move on to starting to use cancer problems. Um, we have actually seen a breakthrough uh, in 2022. So for the last decade or so in Scotland, we've had a national cancer quality audit programme which measures each tumour type uh, against 15 quality performance indicators um, and for the first time we've seen a PROMS based QPI that's been introduced after radical uh, prostatectomy specifically to look at incontinence as an outcome measure. So Public Health Scotland is currently grappling with how we collect that at scale across Scotland. Um, there has been interest in using PROMS as part of cancer medicine strategy since 2016 following the publication of the Montgomery report um, and there is now a recognition that PROMS probably needs to feature uh, within ambitions that we have around uh, 
pay um, medicines access schemes such as outcomes based pricing and there's a dedicated cancer medicines outcome program which is running for a few years and um, trying to work out how we capture outcomes including proms the scottish cancer patient experience survey has been running three early for uh, the last uh, 10 years or so uh, and provides uh, feedback on a cycle uh, and the scottish cancer proms advisory group has recently convened with the role of keeping tabs on what's happening at front line where we see innovation through small projects and pilots uh, thinking about how we use problems and feedback uh, towards national strategy next slide please so i wanted just to highlight the scottish Innov cancer innovation challenge which funded um, a small number of pilot and feasibility projects um, starting about four years ago uh, and the major focus of this was around the chemotherapy and systemic therapies treatment pathway where as Katie mentioned there is evidence that using PROMS uh, in the acute and on treatment context uh, for management of side effects and adverse events can improve outcomes including survival so and this can either be through uh, pre-treatment toxicity assessments on a cycle of continuous monitoring for adverse events with a view to uh, early preventative intervention or self-management through signposting. So there's been there's four projects here that I've highlighted that have operated uh, in haematology. We've looked at using the microclinical outcomes platform at toxicity assessment uh, on a three weekly chemotherapy cycle and how that integrates with the patient and treatment pathway. Uh, we've looked in breast cancer at on chemotherapy toxicity, specifically with real time alerting, um, which prompts the patient to contact to seek um, uh, advice from specialist services uh, in response to specific AEs uh, and also integration with the electronic patient record uh, that's through the OWISE smartphone app. Um, the Edinburgh Cancer Centre undertook a project looking at uh, how we can deploy electronic PROMS capture across multiple different tumour types uh, that operate along different clinical pathways across multiple health boards grappling with some of the uh, uh, challenges around governance across multiple um, legal entities uh, and varying patient pathways. And then finally, an ovarian cancer project, again, looking at using PROMS in earnest in the clinical pathway with EPR integration. Next slide, please. And I guess, so this is part of the feedback from the OWISE smartphone app pilot we did. And I think this illustrates one of the key lessons learned from our various pilots. So whilst we found in this instance that two thirds of patients are willing to use the app um, to support their care during their breast cancer chemotherapy and um, after a few weeks uh, only a third were willing to continue to use it uh, and only 50 percent also would recommend uh, use of the problems based smartphone app to uh, other patients so i think what we learned is that use of problems needs to be part of, uh, part of core care not a bolt-on and i think we've seen some really good examples of how to achieve that through the previous speakers this morning patients need to see value and they need to see that their their problems are being acted on so feedback with a view to improving their care and experience and also clinical teams need to see value um, not just to improve improving the care of their patients but it also needs to make their job easier and i think one of the major bar barriers that we keep coming up against in using problems is if it creates more work for the clinical teams without obvious uh, benefits then uh, it's just not going to be taken up and, uh, and adopted thanks very much so i will hand over to angie Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm Angie and I work with 25 brilliant orthopaedic consultants at Northumbria Healthcare and I manage our in-house um, elective orthopaedic PROMS programme. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So thanks for asking me to share our experiences of embedding uh, PROMS into our pathways at Northumbria. Um, I can't lie, it's been a challenge. Uh, we cover a very large area. We serve a population of half a million people. Um, as I said, we've got 25 orthopaedic consultants. We have five hospitals where orthopaedic surgery is carried out um, and we have had to set up a programme where we can collect PROMs for all of those patients. So until my appointment, the consultants were collecting their PROMs on paper forms in their clinics. Um, and when I first began, we just took two or three subspecialties to start with and we built up from there. I don't cover the hip and knee arthroplasty, but you'll hear a bit about that from the next speaker. So we collect an average of two and a half thousand um, new patient problems per year. As I say, that doesn't cover hip and knee arthroplasty. Um, 
And when we were first looking at it, um, it was important to us to not start thinking about systems and how we're going to record these, but to think in terms of people, because this is a team game. So we spoke to the consultants and so we found out what data they wanted to collect and why and which procedures, uh, what they wanted to do with the data, how they wanted to use it and see it. Um, and they have really driven this programme. Additionally, we spoke to the staff at all of our different sites to find out how we could fit this into the patient's journey through the systems because all of our hospitals work slightly different according to you know, the services there. And as a part of that, my top tip is to give those people some feedback. So every time patients come back with a positive comment about how wonderful people are, I've always made sure to feed that back because that's what people need to hear. So we've now got paper forms which have a standardised ID. So it took about three years before I could get them so that they had their own identity. Um, they're all available on our internet. So any member of staff across our trust can access, download and print a PROMS form for patients. We've had to be pragmatic. We did start trying to collect in clinic when a patient was listed for surgery, um, but I spent a lot of time running around checking whether dates had been changed and whether they'd returned them in time. So now we collect their pre-op proms on the day of surgery. So my team um, annotates our theatre booking system so that the ward clerks know which form we would like done. They print that off, put it in the patient's notes, and when the patient turns up for surgery, they're handed the form and asked to complete it. And then our theatre staff get the forms back to us so that we can uh, record them. So we've got all our own data on paper and in Excel, um, but we do also put a copy of all of our data onto the various national registries. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So we feel it's really important, it's vital that this data needs to be used at patient level. Um, we can't collect patient for the uh, data for the sake of it. Um, it's got to mean something to the patients and clinicians. And this is the patient's story um, and the clinicians need to know this. So for every individual patient, for every form that comes into our office, we calculate the scores. We um, also read and note any comments or any concerns. If we've noticed a drop in their proms, we will feed it all back to their consultants because they know their patients. But then the aggregate level we do actually look at the data internally so the surgeons look at it for service evaluation uh, to inform their clinical practice um, the consultants use it for appraisals it's used for evidence for commissioners um, and for boards and then a lot of our surgeons the consultants the fellows and the registrars like to do audits and they look closely at the data and perhaps cross match with other criteria so x-rays or diagnosis and they produce posters and podium presentations and papers which are used for wider education. So then, as we know, the research and development use PROMS as well, but currently this is separate um, and it is it is slightly different criteria. The time points can be stricter, there can be slightly different data, the analysis may be different, um, but we should have this one set of data and use it for the different, for clinical and for research, we feel. Next slide, please. So our next step is to move away from our paper and Excel and into a robust electronic system. Um, however, we are building in the possibility of paper backup so that it will fit into the system if patients prefer it. We did look at what was out there. Nothing quite did what we wanted it to do. So as a lot of people do, we decided to develop our own, which is really hard work. Um, unlike a lot of other people, we're going to share this. So we are building it as open source and open standards. And um, we have called it open outcomes for that reason. It will allow the evolution and the expansion of um, PROMS in the future because it is built in a template system, which essentially is a plug and play. So you can plug any PROMS, any pathways, any procedures into the system and it will work. Uh, it integrates with PaaS and Active Directory and it is hosted by the trust. So the data doesn't need to leave the organisation. It belongs to the organisation, um, but it is capable of really in-depth data analysis for clinicians, but also for academics and research. 
It's designed by clinicians, which we feel is important. Cl clinicians know what they need and what they want, um, but it has been done in collaboration with experts. So we have PROMS experts via the National PROMS Network. We have got uh, open source and open standards experts at the Aperta Foundation. We've got our brilliant developers, Staircase 13, um, and we will be involving uh, researchers when we go on to um, work on the data analysis side of it, which is the next phase. So it's centrally funded, um, which means it is owned by the NHS for all. Um, and at Northumbria, we are intending to use it for everything that we do now, but have the electronic format. Um, but we also want to use it to allow patient initiated follow up um, and to hopefully reduce face to face appointments where possible. So that's my whirlwind tour of uh, our journey with PROMS and I'll hand you over to Phil Thomas. Great, thanks Sanji for that. Um, so my name is Phil Thomas, thanks for the invitation to speak to you this afternoon. So I've been involved in PROMS now for the uh, best part of 10 years in our department and very much like Andrew, we started off with paper collection and um, you know, I know all too well how difficult it is to collect PROMS on the infrastructure that you need to get any meaningful, res meaningful results. Next slide please. So as we've already heard, I think PROMS is extremely important. Um, it should be patient centric. It should help patients make the right choices for their treatment. Um, it can also make life easier for patients in terms of attending hospital appointments. And also it can enable us as surgeons to make the right choices for implants and certainly in the current climate, reduce cost if possible without compromising quality. Next slide, please. So this, this is just an example of one of the uses of PROMs that we've um, that, we, that we've uh, utilised in Cardiff. Uh, previous to the start of PROMs collection, we had a huge problem with patients in partial booking. So these were arthroplasty patients that were post-op that we just couldn't fit into the system. And there were about 15,000 patients waiting for appointments. So we realized something had to be done. Um, some of these patients, you know, will, may not have been doing as well as we'd hoped. So we had to have some way of um, assessing the patients. So we set up a PROM system where we sent uh, all these patients scores to fill out. And uh, fortunately, there was a high compliance rate with sending the forms back. Um, and this, this has now been our standard follow-up for arthroplasty patients for the last five years. So uh, although it's very nice to see patients and successes of surgery, it's often difficult for patients to attend hospital. Car parking is difficult. They may have to take, take time off work, etc. So they're very happy with the fact that they can send in a form with their PROM score on it. We can assess that, we can look at it, see if it's above the threshold that we have, and actually now less than 5% require face-to-face follow-up. So there's a, a significant cost saving because we're able to get more new patients in the clinic. And uh, again, it helps the carbon footprint in keeping patients at home when they don't need to attend hospital. Uh, what we found is occasionally um, that some scores are lower than we would expect but often patients will write on the forms um, that they have a problem with their other knee or their back is causing an issue when it's not actually the, the implant that's, that's the key problem. And if this is the case, then we'll send them an appointment to try and deal with those things or redirect their, their problem to the correct speciality. Next slide, please. So we started off, uh, as I've said, with paper collection, then we moved to the Amplitude software system, which does have a cost for the trust. Um, but this alone probably doesn't give you the compliance you need. You also need staff chasing up PROM scores, as Angie has said. But you can really get some very useful information which can influence patient choice and surgeon um, procedure as well. So this is just some work that was done on hips and knees. Um, so we had the data crunched and look, looking at various things. So top left there, so a standard hip replacement is known as a hybrid hip replacement. 
but some um, surgeons prefer to use an uncemented hip replacement. And you can see there's really no difference in the, in the PROM gain for, for these patients. The difference, however, is that the uncemented uh, stem is about £700 more expensive than the standard cemented stem. So we can really try and influence choice here uh, by saying to surgeons, look, there's no difference in your patient outcome, so why are you using such an expensive implant? And this is something, again, that the uh, Tim Briggs's group and the Get It Right First Time uh, group have emphasised to the whole of the UK, and uh, trying to decrease variation in treatment is, is actually key. But you have to have the problems to, to actually show to people that there is no difference in what they're doing. On the bottom left there, you can see um, BMI, which is a very um, uh, certainly a topic that's contentious in many trusts. Um, but again, if you have a patient that's very obese, you can discuss with them that their outcome is unlikely to be as good as if they lost weight. So many trusts in Wales now do have a threshold BMI where we try and push patients towards losing weight before they have their surgery um, because their gain just isn't as good. And we know from the literature that the infection rate is about two times uh, if you have patients who are over BMI, uh, over 40. If we go to the top right, looking at some knee data, um, you can see here that um, if you operate on patients too young for a, hip, for a knee replacement, they simply don't do as well as those who are older. It seems common sense because obviously they'll have a higher demand on their knee if they're younger. They may try and do more on it and they may not, simply not be as happy. So again, try and avoid doing your replacement surgery as a first port of call for the younger patients because we know that uh, under 60, the results just aren't as, aren't as good. Bottom right, you can see baseline scores. So this, these are scores that patients start with um, prior to surgery. And it might seem very much common sense, but actually if you start with a pretty high score, you're not going to have much of a gain, but this is something that you have to show the patients for them to perhaps make the right choice for them in perhaps not going for a new implant. Um, other work has been done to try and rationalise implants, uh, the central funnel plot here. So we as orthopedic surgeons are very used to these funnel plots. We have these sent to us um, on a yearly basis by the National Joint Registry. Um, and if you're an outlier, you get to know about it, which helps patients, uh, help surgeons pick the right implants um, and probably the right patients as well, as well, which may not always be in the patient's interest, but everyone tries to protect their outcomes. So on this funnel plot, you can see the different implants that were used in the department uh, at the time that the data was analysed. And you can see that um, every implant apart from number four performed as well. So we drill down into the data to see why the uh, number four implant wasn't performing well. And it was fairly clear that this was a, a very expensive implant and it was used for patients with potential metal allergies. Um, and when this implant was known to cost twice as much and wasn't actually given the right outcomes anyway, um, it was taken off the shelf. So um, I think a good use of getting rid of something that was very expensive and wasn't making any difference to the patients uh, anyway. So just some examples of how we've used uh, PROMS in Cardiff to try and influence patient choice and um, surgeon um, choice as well. And all this is fed back to the surgeons. Everyone's very open about their results and we share our results in a, in a, in a meeting combined with our registry data every year. But I'd like to finish just by saying that you know, this is the, the main problem with PROMS in my view is getting the adequate co collection in place. And this is always a battle and really needs investment from management to make it work properly. So thanks for listening. I'll just hand back to Sally, who I think is going to chair the uh, question and answers. Thank you, Phil. Um, and I'd really like to thank the panel for um, some really brilliant vignettes of how PROMs add value to patient care in multiple different contexts. We've got time for a few questions. Um, and I'd like to address my first question to Mo. Um, Mo, you've been using PROMs in the care of your patients now for, for quite some time. 
Have you encountered any difficulty with questionnaire fatigue? Um, you know, it's something we worry about, isn't it? As, as the growth of, of these proms uh, in clinical practice grows. Uh, yes. Um, there's a number of factors. And in fact, I'm a patient myself with different services and I'm having to complete some proms um, in England where I've got fatigued and not bothered. Um, because so um, obviously it depends on the length of questionnaire, um, choice of questionnaire, how frequently. Uh, we in, interestingly we did a pilot where we got some. I was able to get some coding of a years ago to try and code a cloud-based system, and um, patients were completing it a small amount, like every week. And interestingly, the motivated patient continued. There was no use in, in no utility of measuring at that frequency, um, but we do encounter it um, for chronic disease. If there's a life expectancy over many years, we're going for every six months. Um, if they're waiting in physically in a clinic waiting room, they've got time to spend. Uh, you know, sometimes it's an hour waiting for me so that or my colleagues so um, they can utilize that time so but it is something we have to really be careful with especially with electronic problems where you could be firing off lots and lots of um, questionnaires I think it's just something to think about um, as well as uh, excluding those um, who may not have access to technology. Thanks Mo, uh, really helpful answer I think for the audience. Um, my next question is to Linda and Shonez. Um, you have both implemented PROMS uh, in chronic disease in support of new models of care. And in my experience, it can be difficult to get funding for that type of innovation. Have you seen that the PROMS in highlighting unmet need has helped you make the case for the resources you need for your service development? So. Um, Linda, do you want to go first and then um, hand to Shonet? Yeah, I think I think definitely. I think what we've been able to show by using the PROM date, the outcome data, um, we've been able to make changes within existing resources, which I think has been really important by understanding the patient needs and population. So we've been able to say to obviously to management, well, actually, we've reviewed what we're doing. This, these are the patient reported outcomes. These are the clinical outcomes and actually looking at our workforce, we can make certain changes and have made certain changes within existing resources. However, there's still an unmet need and then we've used the, the PROMS data to try and support our moving forward with the business cases and we've been sort of successful in a couple of areas in the last sort of 12 months or so. Um, so I think it's definitely across that whole sort of pathway helped us to, to change what we're doing prove and demonstrate that we've made those changes, but then actually obtain further funding to transform the services further. Yeah. Thank you. Shona, do you, do you have anything to add from your perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, all the same with us, really, to be honest. I think uh, it's important to say we've been successful and we've got that permanent funding now. Um, so we are now um, in the process of rolling out to uh, provide a service to the full health board rather than just the one cluster. Um, so we're, we're in the process of recruiting staff at the moment. Um, and I do think that without the level of engagement from patients that we've had, um, we, we wouldn't have been able to get that data um, to prove our worth. Um, to be able to carry on and of course we we did um, gather some clinical data as well alongside it so we looked at um, medication use and uh, the number of visits to the GP before and after intervention and um, endoscopy investigations and so on so that I think we had that sort of financial data, I suppose, as well alongside it, which really supported it. But um, but yeah, to answer your question, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Seanad. And, and we've got a question coming in the chat now um, from Tim Hoogenboom. In terms of digital delivery tools of PROMS, so EEPROMS, I guess, um, this is to 
Katie and Peter, I think, because this relates, I think, to the Kermit study quite nicely. What do you consider from what you've learned so far, the key barriers or areas of concern that exist that need to be addressed for those EPROMs to, to be successful? Uh, Katie, do you want to go first and then Peter? Thanks, Sally. Um, Tim, I, I hope we will we'll come up with a better answer than I'm likely to give you now um, when we've finished Kermit um, and hopefully Kermit will really help to identify some of the, the factors that really contribute to a high quality service and might therefore be able to identify some of the things that are areas of concern. I think some of the barriers have been identified during this these presentations as well, um, particularly around sort of resources and and getting buy in from teams um, and, and management, as as Phil Thomas mentioned, actually having having these adequately resourced to support ongoing development. Pete, I think, has more on the ground experience of, of having run the Scottish project and so maybe has more to add about barriers as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess, as I said in my concluding slide, the, I think it needs to make clinicians uh, workflow more efficient um, uh, and need to avoid the perception that this is just adding to, uh, you know, an already burdened service in terms of workflow without value. And the patients need to see the, you know, the, the value of completing problems and participating in the digital, um, you know, if the digital problem is in participating, you know, signing up and logging on and using uh, uh, the platform. I think, I guess one of the things that we've worked quite hard at is um, trying to integrate problems into existing um, clinical workflow and patient pathways rather than, I think even simple things like, you know, if problems uh, are accessed through a separate system to the EPR, then that's an additional step in a busy clinic. Um, so looking at integrating um, the results of PROMS assessments with, uh, you know, other parts of clinical workflow like blood, blood results or, or radiology results and these sorts of things, I think just makes it uh, kind of feasible and plausible that um, they'll be used in day to day practice. So I think it's these sort of simple things that we just need to get right um, if we're going to be able to use them in day to day practice. I guess that's a different thing to using PROMS for, as part of audit um, where it's perhaps more about setting standards and uh, motivating completion um, where the value is at, at population level rather than the individual uh, patient level and I'm not sure that beyond uh, kind of one-off or time limited audits um, will achieve that without getting the former right and using PROMS in earnest in uh, in you know in day-to-day -day patient care. Sally I might just add briefly I think personally one of the challenges has been thinking about the questionnaires and the tools that you use to to feedback from patients there's obviously a number of different tools developed across a range of different diagnoses but actually when you come to use them in routine care you sort of look at them and you're not you're not necessarily sure they're going to achieve exactly what you want to and so I think that's sometimes something that acts as a barrier as well is that that sort of sheer overwhelming which one of these do I use I want to use something robust but how do I identify the tool that's the most robust? So again, hopefully that's something that in the long run Kermit might be able to help with by identifying projects that appear to be performing well and what are they using that is helping them to perform well? Yes, thank you. And I, I think there's two particularly important points there. One around prom evolution as, as we do more and more of this. And I think the other point you made, uh, Peter, is very valid about how this is another task that may sit alongside other tasks embedded in patient facing technology in support of care the better information for patients generally uh, to support their management such as blood tests and correspondence and so on so i think that's a really important point final question to phil and angie i want to pick up the the cultural change point really uh, about embedding proms you've both been embedding proms in orthopedics for a long time now have you seen your uh, the attitudes of orthopaedic colleagues change over the last five years uh, with respect to the use of PROMS, particularly in direct care, for example, in support of virtual review. Um, Angie, would you like to go first and then and then Phil, you get the last word. Um, thanks, Sally. Yeah, to an extent, I mean, I'm really lucky we've got really um, innovative and interested and engaged consultants here, they have driven this, they were the ones that wanted it. However, as with everything, you have people who are early adopters and later adopters. 
Um, and yes, as we have made clear that you know we're doing this to add extra information for them, I think even the later adopters now appreciate having that PROMS feedback. And I think that's important. You've got to give people what they want from a system if you're asking them to do something with it. I'll hand over to Phil. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think um, as as a general rule, um, doctors are fairly competitive, certainly surgeons are, and certainly orthopaedic surgeons are. And, uh, you know, everyone likes to have the best prom scores. So once you institute something like this, um, most people are really keen to be involved or they feel left behind. Um, so I think it's not been difficult to get clinician buy-in. Um, other things that we would like to push on with, which um, we're not far away from in Wales now, is is actually being able to show the patients their scores as part of their follow up. Um, and, and I think that really helps patients to feel that they've improved uh, as as well as the doctor feeling that they've improved. So I think, you know, this is something that's absolutely critical to, to push on with. Um, but as I said, it's, it's getting that compliance We've talked a little bit about patient questionnaire exhaustion. That certainly is an issue. Um, we found that there was no difference really between um, collecting six month scores and 12 month scores. So you know, we dropped the, dropped the six months. So that means just one less questionnaire for the patient. Thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, and you know, from a personal perspective, I know that some of this is very, very hard and there are still a lot of challenges to overcome, but I've seen huge progress in the use of PROMS in direct care over the last five or six years. I think we probably all have, haven't we? So uh, lots still to do, but, but we've come a long way already. So it just uh, remains for me to thank um, the panel for their expert insights today and um, see you next time. <laughs>